Welcome to the Practical Anatomy 10-hour training through the Inner Dimension Academy. My name is Michael Prieto. I am a yoga instructor, a holistic lifestyle coach, as well as a strength and conditioning coach. I've been teaching and guiding movement for over a decade now. I've spent thousands of hours teaching and facilitating movement. I've been a movement director for multiple Nike, Nike Yoga, Nike Running, Adidas, video and photo shoots. And I was even Jane Fonda's personal trainer for several years. Since my time in college, I've spent many years and hours studying biomechanics, kinesiology, as well as exercise science. Since the age of 15, I spent many hours in the gym dojo, working one-on-one -on -one with a personal trainer, and getting many hours of hands-on experience of movement. Developing my mind and body for optimal physical strength, as well as performance. My passion for movement runs deep, and I am so looking forward to diving deeply into this training with you. Over the course of this training, you will accumulate an extensive wealth of knowledge when it comes to biomechanics as it relates to yoga asana as well as how to effectively integrate these lessons into your own personal practice, as well as the practice that you guide and facilitate with your students. Whether you consider yourself a student or a teacher or both, my hope is that you will walk away from this training with many more tools in your toolbox. Why is anatomy important? If I could pinpoint it to one reason and one word, that word would be safety. The safer that a student feels in their practice has a tremendous effect on their ability to absorb information and increases their potential for greater transformation on and off of their mat. There have been too many times in practices and classes that I've gone to where I haven't felt 100% safe in my body based solely off of the words and language that a teacher is using as well as incorrect anatomical cueing. And as a result, I typically don't end up practicing with those teachers again. And I don't want this to be you or anybody who's teaching, which is why I'm going to share with you as much as I possibly can when it comes to anatomy and biomechanics. When we feel safe, we can relax. We can deeply breathe. We can use the full range of motion of our diaphragm. One of the biggest things that inspired me to pursue teaching yoga was the opportunity to share from my perspective, the way in which I feel and view human movement. As I was deepening my personal asana practice in the 2010s, I started to realize that there was somewhat of a lack of understanding of human anatomy as it relates to yoga asana. And this is nobody's fault, and that is important to understand nobody's to blame, not the teacher nor the teachers who they studied with or beyond. Within the context of a 200-hour teacher training, there are only so many hours that you can allocate to studying anatomy. You could literally spend over 200 hours reviewing anatomy. You could spend over 200 hours researching and going over the sutras. You could spend over 200 hours going over breath work and meditation and Ayurveda. There are so many things that you could really dive deep into. So it only makes sense that within the 200 hour structure, there's only a certain amount of hours that can be dedicated to studying anatomy. And for someone who's a new student, if this is your first time getting to dive into anatomy, it's nice to have a little bit of an understanding, but that little understanding is only going to get you so far. And it would be such a great service to yourself as an instructor, as well as your students, to take time to deepen that self-study, svadhyaya, and seek out further education of anatomy. Because at the end of the day, yoga asana is a physical practice. 
the muscles, the joints, the ligaments, the tendons, the fascia. Yoga asana is all about that and so much more and so much deeper as we all know. But the physical body plays a huge role in our practice on our mat. Student safety is number one. So the more that we can educate ourselves, the more that we'll be able to safely and effectively guide students throughout the practice. And as teachers and instructors, we should take full ownership of being in the seat of the teacher. So a deep bow to every single one of you for taking the initiative to dive a little bit deeper with me. And another deep bow of gratitude for you trusting myself as well as the whole Inner Dimension team. I look forward to the journey. Much love. Now before we move on, I want to review a bit of the anatomy lectures from the 200 hour teacher training and also review a little bit of the language from that training as well. So let's begin with some of the basic anatomy cueing in regards to the actions of the joints and how those show up in our asana practice. We'll begin with the anterior, the front side of the body, as well as the posterior, the back side of the body. So for the anterior, the front side of the body, we have specific muscles that would be anterior muscles like the rectus abdominis, the quads, the anterior tibialises, those muscles on the front side of the body. On the posterior side of the body or the posterior chain, we have more specific muscles like the QLs, the glutes, the hamstrings, and the calves. We engage the anterior chain of our body in postures like plank pose or as we're rounding our spines in cat pose and we engage the posterior chain of the body as we are extending our spine in cow pose or shalabhasana or other back bends. Now in some of those poses where we also find that extension and engagement of the posterior chain like cobra, upward facing dog or cow pose, we also find a little bit of shoulder retraction pulling the shoulders back towards one another, towards the spine. And this brings me to the next few words, flexion and extension. Now, a lot of our joints flex and shorten in range of motion, as well as extend and lengthen. Our elbows flex and extend, our hips flex and extend, our knees flex and extend. And typically, extension is coupled with an inhalation and, a f and flexion is coupled with an exhalation as we're rounding. We find flexion in the spine as we forward fold. We find extension in the spine, again, with many back bends. Our shoulders are another joint that also flexes and extends. When we raise our arms over our head, as in warrior one or chair pose, our shoulders are flexing. And we find extension in the shoulders as we interlace our hands behind our backs and come into humble warrior or any interlaced hand fold. Now in many standing postures, you'll see some common similarities. For example, in warrior one, warrior two, crescent pose, that front hip of the front leg is in flexion while the back hip, the opposite hip, is an extension, and in some of those postures, even a little bit of external rotation. So most of our joints do flexion and extension. When it comes to the ankles, they do two variations of flexion. When we point our toes, we plant our flex, and when we draw the toes back towards the knee, it's called dorsiflexion. I also briefly mentioned something about retraction when it comes to the shoulders. Now the shoulders do multiple things. One of the main things that they do is retract. So the space between the shoulder blades shortens and they also protract. So that space between the shoulders increases. And we find a bit of that in cat and cow, right? As we come into 
cow pose and we extend, we simultaneously retract the shoulders. Same thing like in cobra pose. And as we round our spine in cats, we find protraction of the shoulders. So that space increases. And we also see a little bit of that in plank pose as we're actively pushing ourselves away from the floor. Naturally, there's a little bit of protraction that takes place there. So there's an increase of space between the shoulder blades. Now, take a moment and think in what other pose besides ones that I just named could you encourage a little bit of protraction of the shoulder blades. So earlier I briefly mentioned as far as coming into some of the back bends about shoulder retraction, like in cobra pose or in cow pose. As we extend the spine, there's a simultaneous retraction of the shoulders that takes place. So that space between the shoulder blades shortens. Opposite of protraction, where we find an increase of space between the shoulder blades. Like when we are rounding in cat pose, there's natural protraction that happens. So take a moment and think, what other posture could you encourage students to find a little bit of protraction in their shoulder blades? For me, the first one that comes to mind is plank pose. So when we're holding plank pose on our hands, cueing to actively push the floor away and push our chest further away from the floor, which will naturally create a little bit more protraction and space between the shoulder blades. Simultaneously cueing to depress the shoulder blades as well. So that cue of actively pushing the chest away from the floor serves yourself as well as the student many benefits. It serves yourself because you're bringing your students awareness to maybe an unfamiliar place and helping them to hopefully get a better understanding of what's going on in their body, a little bit more body awareness. And in that, as a result, your student will probably find a little bit more trust in yourself. And when, as a student, we trust our teachers, we feel safe. This also helps to build a solid foundation in any student's practice, as well as building a bit of muscular endurance, strength, and resiliency. Also, by some of these more deeper biomechanical cues, you might really save some of your students from being injured. And as we all know, spending time being injured is not fun and it takes us away from our movement practices. So if I, as a student, go into a teacher's class and they're giving me really good biomechanical cues and things to think about that are helping me to feel my body in deeper ways and put my body in better structural places that keep me a bit safer, then over time, again, I start to build more endurance. I start to build more strength. I start to build more familiarity within my own body. And in doing so, resiliency increases. So that means, hopefully, there's less time being spent injured especially when it comes to areas around the shoulders because our shoulders are the most mobile joints in our bodies, which also makes them the most susceptible to injury. Dedicated students love knowing about these little micro adjustments. I just taught a class last week where I really dove deep into biomechanical and anatomical cueing and feedback that I got from a student was so, so helpful and supportive for him. And he really voiced and expressed how those tiny little micro adjustments and how deep I was going with the cueing really supported his practice. And I'll reiterate again, this also benefits yourself as the teacher because your students will start to gain more and more trust in you. And as that trust builds, so will your following. You'll start to have more and more students coming back into your classes, which is a great thing. You just provided them with potentially life-changing information, which they can implement and integrate immediately. 
So another pose where you might encourage a little bit of protraction in the shoulders is Garudasana, eagle pose. So as that interlace and wrap comes with the elbows, I always like to cue lifting the elbows, the height of the shoulders, and then actively pulling the elbows away from the backs of the shoulders. And that's gonna naturally create a little bit more protraction of the shoulders, a bit more space there. Now take another moment. In what other pose or poses could you encourage retraction of the shoulder blades besides some of the poses that I named like cobra, up dog, or cow pose? Some poses that come to mind for me are reverse plank, altar or reverse tabletop, even when cactusing and bending the arms in Anjane Asana or a crescent pose. As you hopefully are already beginning to feel and understand, thinking about biomechanics as it relates to yoga asana gives you a whole new language in which you can share and communicate with your students. And like I like to say and remind students from time to time is that depressed shoulders are actually happy shoulders. And I'll tell you why. Because when the shoulders are not depressed, then that means they're a little bit elevated. And typically for most of us, we hold a lot of our tension and our stress in our traps, which causes the shoulders to naturally elevate. So when we actively depress our shoulders down, we're creating more space between the bottoms of the ears and the tops of the shoulders. We're creating more space around the sides of your neck. And we're also starting to engage your lats, the biggest muscles on our upper body. So when the shoulders are depressed, naturally they're a bit more softened and that has a direct effect on our nervous system. This is one of the most common things that I see with students in class is elevated shoulders while holding a plank posture, elevated shoulders while lowering down into chaturanga, elevated shoulders when lowering from plank all the way down to the floor and even sometimes elevated shoulders when the arms are overhead in chair pose or in warrior one. I think the only times that I have ever consciously asked students to elevate and shrug their shoulders was in correlation with an inhalation to then immediately soften the shoulders on the exhale. So saying inhale, draw the shoulders up to the ears, and then exhale, soften the shoulders away from the ears. Other than that, I can't name another time that I've actually ever cued students to shrug their shoulders. So why this is so important, specifically when it comes to lowering down from plank, holding plank, or lowering down all the way to the floor or chaturanga, this is really important because as we're holding plank pose, and our shoulders are somewhat elevated, that means that ball and socket joint of both of our shoulders is a lot more mobile and more susceptible to injury. It's not super stable. The shoulders are what I like to call unpacked. Same can be said as we're lowering down, either to chaturanga or down to the floor. If the shoulders are elevated as that action is happening, our shoulder joints are much less stable, again, making them more susceptible to injury. So what we want to do and cue and for yourself begin feeling so that you can begin implementing in your teaching is actively depressing your shoulders down because the primary muscles that do that action of depression are the lats. And when we depress the shoulders and engage the lats, our shoulder joints are much more stable. That's what I like to call packing the shoulders. So specifically when we're lowering down to the floor, begin noticing in your own practice as well as the practice of your students if you can see a little bit of elevation in the shoulders. It's something that I commonly see. So bringing your students awareness, but first your awareness in your own practice with your own body, bringing that awareness to the shoulders and consciously cueing and verbalizing through very simple words 
for the students to depress their shoulders and keep them away from the ears as they're holding plank or as they're lowering down to the floor. So you make it more of an active pull down towards the floor. And this is beneficial for so many reasons. That main reason, that one word, safety. It's gonna help to keep your students and yourself, your shoulders, much more safe. Also, you're gonna to start to build more endurance, more strength, and more resiliency in your whole shoulder girdle, as well as your lats. And when we strengthen the lats, that helps to keep the shoulders relaxed. And it helps with the posture as well. So often I cue for students to actively pull themselves down to the floor. Or even with malasana, when we're standing, to actively use the hip flexors to pull down into that deep squat. This helps to bring your students' awareness to areas and muscles in the body that should be doing the work when it comes to these actions of joints in the body. And this can lead to transformation. And transformation and positive change begins with awareness. All right, a few more pieces and then we'll move on. Internal and external rotation. So our shoulders, as well as our hips, the two major joints, do internal rotation as well as external rotation. Internal rotation typically happens in one shoulder when we come into certain binds, like in Gomukhasana, or when we're coming into that bind inside angle about to rise on up into bird of paradise. So there's typically one shoulder that's an internal rotation while the opposite is an external rotation. The hips, like I mentioned as well, do internal and external rotation. Internal rotation of the hips typically happens when we are in Gomukhasana. A little internal rotation of the thighs, hugging and squeezing in where external rotation can be found in goddess pose. So typically when it comes to the rotation of the hips, whether they're neutral, they're externally rotated or internally rotated, we can get a good gauge of that depending on where the toes are pointed. So if the toes are pointed straight ahead, typically the hips are in neutral rotation or just neutral. If the toes are pointed out, then the hips are in external rotation. And if the toes are somewhat pointed inwards, typically internal rotation. External rotation of the shoulders can be a little more subtle. I can't think of too many postures where you'd cue external rotation, but there definitely are some. In downward facing dog, you can cue a little bit of external rotation in the shoulders. Or in chair pose, as the arms are reaching up, a little bit of external rotation of the shoulders, as well as with warrior one. Like I mentioned before, in a lot of the standing postures, there's typically one hip that is pointed straight ahead, neutrally rotated and flexed in flexion, while the opposite hip is in a little bit of external rotation. That hip is typically an extension. And with a pose like Warrior One, we're doing our best with that back leg and that back hip to internally rotate that hip. Now the toe is slightly pointed out. So if I'm thinking about it from an anatomical standpoint, it feels to me like in Warrior One, the hips are a little bit externally rotated, but at the same time, we're doing our best to internally rotate that hip to pull that frontal hip point forwards, which is why when we come into Warrior One as opposed to Warrior Two, with Warrior One, we step that back foot out a little bit wider so we create more space there to allow for that internal rotation action to happen in that back hip. The last piece when it comes to actions of the joints, we'll look at the legs and the hips. Adduction and abduction. So adduction, A-D-D, -D, you can think of it very simply like adding together. So that happens when we're squeezing the thighs together, like in Gomukhasana.
or like in a lot of the standing postures, warrior one, warrior two, even in triangle pose, as well as crescent pose, creating a little bit of that adduction in the legs or that action of scissoring the legs together, that is bringing and adding together, which helps to, one, build more awareness to the adductors, a place that for most people is a bit underactive and weak, so it helps to bring your awareness or your student's awareness to that area, which then you start to build that endurance by holding that posture and breathing into it. And then comes the strength and the resiliency, less susceptibility to injuries. So adduction is hugging in and moving towards one another, moving towards the midline. Whereas AB, abduction, is the opposite, moving away and spreading. So what I just mentioned about the adduction in the legs, especially in those standing postures, has really been a game changer for myself and my personal practice. When I first began practicing, I was not aware that I, not that I should or I shouldn't be doing that, but that I could be doing that and that it would tremendously help my body and my physical practice. So whenever I come into some of those standing postures, I always feel in my body that sensation of adduction. So I bring my awareness there and breath by breath and pose by pose, the many seconds and minutes that I spend holding some of those postures, whether I'm flowing or it's a little more stationary and isometric, I start to build and have built more and more endurance in my adductors. And over time, they have gotten stronger and stronger, which means that my body and myself in those specific postures has gotten a lot more stronger, which personally has given me more confidence when I come into those postures. I feel really great. I feel like I can hold them for a long time without feeling early on that my legs are gonna potentially fall off and I'm gonna fall to the floor. I feel much more strong in those postures, which ultimately means that there's more confidence that I feel in my practice, which is great. A few other postures where you can create a little more of that adduction and start to build more endurance and strength there in the inner thighs are all of the Prasarita Padottanasana folds, those wide-legged folds. So as opposed to kind of letting the legs slip away from one another, a little more abduction, I like to consciously root my feet down, specifically the outer edges, and create a little bit of that inward samana energy hugging in so that I always am building a bit of awareness and endurance to my inner thighs. Those little pieces have had such a profound impact on my personal practice. And those are some of the things that I get to share with students as I'm teaching and guiding and facilitating. And again, it all begins with awareness. And now you know. So I encourage every single one of you to bring in that heightened sense of awareness as you're flowing through your practice to really feel what it feels like to engage and make these micro adjustments in your own body so that you can start to develop that endurance and strength in your own physical body. Moving on. Let's talk about planes of motion. So we have the sagittal plane of motion where things are kind of moving forwards and backwards or you can think of that kind of like squatting or hinging, chair pose, even holding a plank would take place in the sagittal plane. And then we have the lateral or the frontal plane, so more side to side movement, something like goddess pose or skandhasana. And then we have the transverse plane, which is where rotation and twisting takes place. The biggest takeaway for myself when it comes to the planes of motion as it relates to yoga asana is trying to incorporate a good variety, a conscious variety of integrating these different planes of motion. Typically in a class, even if you're not thinking about planes of motion, 
you're most likely hitting all three of them and getting students to move in all three planes. But sometimes with my sequencing, I like to really emphasize at least two specific planes of motion. Other times, I like to just incorporate all three of them so that I can really give students a well-rounded practice because moving in one plane of motion is great, but when we do a similar movement and move in a different kind of plane of motion, that helps to bring more body awareness into our students' practices and into our own practices. So the more planes of motion that we can move in, the better. Life doesn't just take place in the sagittal plane, and neither should your practice. All right, so that about wraps up the review from the anatomy that was covered in the 200-hour teacher training. In the next few lectures, we're going to be reviewing the upper body as well as the lower body. This is just the beginning of our deep dive together, and my hope is that you begin implementing some of these teachings in your own practices as well as the students whom you serve. Empower yourself first so that you can empower others. It's already happening. All right, so that is it for this one. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your full attention. And I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.